My name is Isaac Adala. I work with Baraka Agriculture College under the beekeeping section where we deal with the fabrication of hives, uh, training of uh, beekeepers that is within and without Baraka College. We also do it the, in terms of buying honey from farmers, in terms of processing the honey, they are also selling and marketing the honey for the farmers or any other cooperative available within our pre premises. So basically here we are in the Baraka workshop where we deal with the, in terms of making of the hives. So we deal with making uh, three types of hives. One, you have the Kenya top Bible, what we call the KTBH. And then two, we have uh, the Langstroth hive. The last one, we have uh, the log hive that we make within here. So right uh, behind you is our receiving section where we normally receive, t uh, normally receive timber after seasoning. Seasoning is where we dry the timber to a specified moisture content that is normally below 60 to 50 percent of moisture content required for making the hives. So we prefer, we have got specific type of the normal use for making of hives, where we use, uh, we, when we use pine, we use cypress, we even use cedar, because uh, the smell are normally good for the bees. The bees normally feel comfortable with the kind of timber that we use, that is uh, cypress, cedar, or uh, pine in particular. So that is the receiving end. We start uh, receive the, the timber from there. We do the cutting from here, the same, same point here. We do the generic part of it from here. Then after that, we go to our next, uh, our next station there, where we do the joinery, the basic joinery of some of the hive uh, parts, then hive components like uh, fixing the body, fixing the hive lid, fixing the queen excluder, doing the waxing until we have the product in our last store that we shall be able to visit later on. I'll begin with the first one, which is the log hive, which is under the traditional type of hive. This is a hive that was being used a uh, long time ago, where you just cut timber, just cut, t you just cut a, a tree, then you, make, you get the trunk, and then from the trunk, you just make a hole for the bees to occupy that particular hive. So the condition is that one, the timber, must, that particular trunk must be dry because bees like staying in a warm and warm environment. So you just cut a tree, you get the trunk, then you make a hole to have you, and then you make the entrances for the bees to come in and go out. Now the log is a, it has got some, uh, maybe it's some of the benefits are one, it is normally cheap to make because just cut a tree at the comfort uh, at the comfort of your home then you have your hive to go then now in terms of uh, the disadvantages there are many because one in terms of managing the bees it becomes a bit difficult for you because once the bees occupy that particular hive you cannot open the hive to do the inspection to do the colony division and any other beekeeping aspect so that is the traditional that is the log hive then now we have the the, the other two that is the KTB, then we have the Langstroth hive these are the modern types of hive. I'll begin with the KTBH. So KTBH is like an improvised version of log hive, only that is having the movable top bus. This particular point, we have one hive, but now we introduce two sections from the same same hive, whereby we're trying to give the bee, the queen bee, the one side to maybe in terms of laying the eggs, then the other side to have uh, the honey stored. So we have the super, then we have the brood. The brood chamber is where the queen will be staying to lay the eggs in terms of uh, the colony monitoring it does from the brood chamber. And now in the super chamber is where the honey is stored. So basically we have one hive, but divided into two sections. Even in terms of making the work for the bees, it's very, very simple. Even for the, the beekeeper, you get to harvest, you only deal with the super chamber where you get your honey. The last we have the Langstroth hive. Now in the Langstroth hive, the bee is kind of an improved version of uh, the, uh, the KTBH. Only that the shape is different, it's kind of a box. Then now it uses frames instead of top bars. Now with the frames, it has a supporting one that I'll show you later on. Now the shape is different, it's a box. The two parts still exist, the super, then the brood. But now the extraction part of it is different because you have a special equipment to use when getting your honey from the Langstroth hive, unlike in the KTB. H. Advantages are many. You can do colony division, you can do colony multiplication, you can do queen rearing, and many other beekeeping aspects. Also, but not forgetting, in terms of controlling the bee pests, it can be controlled nicely using the modern types of hives. Because the standard measurement that somebody is supposed to, to follow that can be shared, because we have the standard measurement from uh, the National Beekeeping Institute that somebody can follow. They're standard. Meaning, for example, if you happen to buy a hive from Molo, then you buy a hive from uh, Nairobi. Let's use an example of a lungs of hive. And then you want to do the colony division. The frames are supposed to fix because the measurements are standard across all of them. So in Molo, in Nairobi. So the measurements are there. I'll share them with you to have a look at each and every. Only that we don't have the measurements for the 
log high because we are trying to do a bit of uh, improvement on the same. But the other ones, we shall share the measurements with you to have a look at it. They're the standard measure that's supposed to be used everywhere and to be followed generally when making a hive. Now, so in terms of making a hive, it, first of all, I've got various factors that normally determine that. First of all, you have a look at the availability of the material to making the hive. So if you have all the materials constant and available, then also the labor, when it is a bit available for everything, it can take us like in a day here in Baraka, we manufacture like 20 hives in a day with the three people available providing labor for the same. So depending on the available materials in the in area, or 20 hives per day in Baraka using two people working in the workshop area until you have a complete hive. So meaning one person can make, can make like five hives in a day. So now in terms of uh, the challenge, first of all, we, we, we've tried as, as much as possible to cut the challenges because we normally bring in people who are trained, who have the skills in making uh, the hives or even dealing with the timber related issues. Because previously we've been having people who don't have the skills in making the hives. And then they end up, you know, here we have machines, so they even end up cutting their hands. But now because we have got people who are experts in the same area, we've cut that particular problem by 100%. So we have people who are skilled. Thereby, that problem of having unskilled people, we've cut it down. Another thing is that the machines that we're using here, they're a bit expensive. So in terms of so someone who wants to begin making the hives, they're a bit expensive for him to begin. The machines are a bit expensive. So, so far, so that's the problem that we experience here. But any other, if you have any other, maybe later on, if it comes in the coming years, we shall let you know. But as for now, we'll have the problem uh, with the, the machines are a bit expensive for somebody to acquire at an individual level. So, so I'm going to use uh, Langsot as an example. It has got uh, like four parts, where you have the bottom board, that is the lower part. Then you have the super, the brood board that come immediately from the bottom board. Then you have the queen excluder. So basically, that particular queen excluder is just, just like a mesh. We are trying to restrict the queen. In a hive, we've got uh, three types of bees. We have the queen, we have the worker, we have the drone. This particular case, they're trying to restrict the queen only in the brood chamber so that she can lay eggs in the brood chamber only and then we have honey in the super chamber. Thereby, we're going to harvest our honey. It is pure, free from the brood from the queen. So we have the queen in between the two. Then now on the upper part, we have the super box. Then on the top part, we have the lid to cover preventing from sunshine, from rainfall. Then we have the frames that are contained inside the both, both uh, chambers for the bees to construct a comb on them. Those are the parts that you can have in hive. Like in KTBH, we have uh, the lid, we have the top bar, we have the queen, then we have the hive body itself. If you're not using the queen excluder, like in the low hive, the bees normally have the natural behavior whereby they try to create a bound between the honey and the brood. So if you don't use the queen excluder, to some point when going to harvest, if you don't have the skills in beekeeping, you'll end up harvesting both honey and the brood, thereby compromising the quality of your honey. But if you have got the, that particular mesh in between the two, you have got clear separation of the brood and the honey. Meaning even if you're going to harvest the honey, you are harvesting pure, clean honey away from the brood from the what? Queen, because you can mix the honey and the brood, thereby affecting the quality of honey. So it is good for you to have the queen. But now in some other cases, and sometimes it doesn't work. So if it doesn't work, you also know, we also have another way that you can do it and control the same particular thing. Good, so in terms of controlling the pest, that's the pest that normally talk about either in the apiary or any other place. So first of all, also when making our hives, or what you call the hive stand that we make. So that particular hive stand, it has what you call the oil trap. Now the oil trap is where we put the oil or do the greasing to control issues to do with the, the termites, issues to do with safari, safari ants. So we prefer people using the metallic hive stands to control the same. Then also we normally advise the people on where you place your hive where you install your hive. You're supposed to only have an area that is dry away from the termites areas or the safari ants. So we teach them, but we have the stand with an oil trap, then where you can apply your grease to control the same. Okay, so now in terms of uh, technologies, yes, we, uh, we've been having them come. For example, we have what you call the CA beehive. That is the complete African beehive. Whereby they're trying to have a look at how they can improve on the hive aeration, either in either part, in hot and dry, areas. So we have them coming in, but now if I use the example of concrete hive, yes it can be used, but now we have a challenge in terms of controlling the pest, but it is a good that you can use in the same, but now in terms of controlling the pest is a big 
challenge for that particular case. But we have got the CA behind that is being used currently and it is working perfectly just to control in terms of uh, the hive temperatures. If they're high, it can be easily controlled. You also have what you call the, the flow hive. That's not for somebody who fear bees. Where you can just take, you can, you can, you can buy the flow hive, you can put it in an apple, then you la, you'll be harvesting the honey without opening the hive. But now, the, in terms of learning, learning there is minimal because learning be keeping you learn by opening the hive. But if you're having the flow hive, learning is very, very minimal. So we have the flow hive, we have the CAB, then of course you have the concrete hive, as you said. So now for that particular farmer, you know, he need to have the, maybe just the kickoff skills. So now when you want to do that particular thing, the, what you can do is that look at the perfect timber. Look at the perfect timber to use for making the hive. Then that particular, after cutting the tree, the timber or the trunk must be dry because you can get a trunk that is wet, the bees will not occupy that particular hive. So it must be dry for it to get the bees. So I can advise one, get the timber, make it dry, then you can make your hive comfortable from it, then you can install perfectly in the recommended area. So have a look at the timber itself first before you end up making the hive. Okay, so now once we have the beehive ready after it has been made, we normally put what you call the wax. Now wax is what you get from the combs of the honey. Then now we melt the comb, we get the wax, we smear the wax inside the hive. In an example, when you're using the top bar, we wax the top bars. Then in the lungs of the hive, we do the wax trip in the frames, now to attract the bees. So we do all those here, then now, now once the hive is ready, it is now good and free for delivery and attracting bees. So we can sell to the customer or even install in our own apiaries here. Good, so here we are now in the last part of the workshop where we have the equipment ready. They have already been assembled, we have already done the painting part of it. So whatever is there is ready for dispatch and uh, selling to our customers. So this is what you call the observation hive, from the word observation. If you want to have a class and want people to have a look at the bees, how they are behaving. So we take the bees either from the KTB or from the lungs, and then we put the, the frames inside here. Then now we put it in class. We can observe the bees from the class or any other point because the bees are inside and then you have the glass from both ends where we can do the observation now maybe you can have a look at the queen the worker the brood and the honey so it is the observation hive it can be used anywhere mostly for teaching and learning purposes then here here now we have the we have the langstroth hive that I, I talked about uh, previously so here are the parts from this point here we have the entrance from here to here this is the entrance these two here then now we have the brood from here to here, the brood chamber. Then now we have the, that, that particular, the queen excluder in between, which is this one here. Then now on top here, we have the super chamber, this one here. Then you have the frames that are contained inside the hive. This, this is the example of the frame that we have in the super box. Then we finally we have uh, the lid on top. Then on the lid, it has got two layers, uh, linings. We have got the inner part, the insulation cover. In, in case of excessive heat in hot, Areas. So that is a complete Langstroth hive with the brood for the queen, with the super where they store their honey. Then here we have uh, what you call the catcher box. So catcher box is just uh, a mini, a mini Langstroth hive where we normally use it for trapping colonies. For example, you want to trap a colony maybe in a neighborhood, so you take a catcher box, then you put it on top of a tree, then you do the baiting, attracting bees inside. Then now. Then once the bees occupy the, the catcher box, you transfer it. Whatever is contained inside the catcher box is whatever is contained inside the Langstroth hive. The frames are in there. It can either be frames or the top bars. This is how it, it looks uh, from within. I'll open it. Here we have uh, the frames. So the frame size here is the same size in the brood box. So after you trap the colony, you transfer into an empty hive. The catcher box used for one, trapping, and then two, transferring a colony to an empty hive. So that is our catcher box that we have here. The next here we have uh, the Langstroth hive, the, the KTBH, sorry, the Kenya Top Bar hive. You can see the shape is a bit uh, different, but I'll open up for us to have a look at it. So I'll, this is the lid, the upper part, this is the lid. This is the lid here. Good. And then now we have, uh, in this case, we have the frames, but here we have the top bars. These are the top bar. On top here, we do what you call waxing. We apply the wax. 
in our workshop here so that we can be able to attract the bees inside the hive. Then also it has got the two parts, the brood, then the super. The brood part is where the entrance is on that particular end as we come. This, so this is our Kenya Toba hive. Then we have this one here that we place uh, for order. We have the one from uh, Netfund and the Kenya Forest Services. So here we have what you call the feeder boxes. For example, we have an area where there is drought. There is no flowers for the bees. So as a beekeeper, you can do what you call supplementary feeding. We provide what you call the sugar syrup. You mix water and sugar in the ratio of one is to one. So you put it inside here. This is the, the feeder box, but now for the Langstroth hive. So you pour it in and then now you put it inside the hive, but on the brood chamber. Then this is for the lungs. Then we have one for the KTBH. This is the feeder box for Kenya Toba hive. You make your syrup, you pour in, and then now you put it inside the hive. But remember, in the brood chamber, so that the bees can be able to get the syrup for supplementary feeding. Those are our feeder boxes, both for Langsoth and also for Kenya Toba hive. We know most people fear handling bees, so we normally try to come up with a bee suit so that at least they can have some confidence when either opening or dealing with the bees. So here we have our, what you call the beekeeping bee suit with the various parts, as you can see. So we have the first part, which is the head veil. So this particular point to here, that is covering the face and the head part of the body. Then you have the apron from here to here that is covering entirely the body. Then you have the gumboots here, down here. Then uh, lastly, we have uh, the gloves for protecting the hands against the bee sting. So for it to be complete, it must consist of one, the head veil, this one, then the apron, then uh, the gloves, then lastly, it must have the gumboots for you to be able to work comfortably with the bees. So we have got uh, different materials that we use for making the bee suits. One, we have the nylon, like this one here. This is a nylon bee suit. Then we also have the cotton one bee suit. But now the prices are a bit different because of the material that is being used in making of the bee suit. But this is a nylon bee suit that is complete for any beekeeper or any person who wants to handle bees at any point, whether removing bees from a home or harvesting honey or even doing an inspection or even rescuing people who are being attacked by the bees. That is our complete bee suit. A honey, a honey press. So when you're harvesting honey from the KTBH, nowadays we're trying to advance more on the technologies that we're being using. That is both when you're making the hive, use the current, the current method or the current technology. And then also we use the current tools when processing the honey. So after harvesting our honey from the Kenya Top Bar Hive, we have what you call the honey press. So honey press, the word honey basically is used for pressing honey from the honey combs. So we cut the comb, we open the honey press here. But we open this one here, then you put the combs down there. Then we rotate. So upon rotation, it will be pressed as it goes downwards from the honey press. So we open, then we close. So upon pressing it, the honey will come from these spacings here. Then you collect the honey from that particular end. Either we do processing or two, we do the direct packaging to sell it as raw honey to our customers. So here we have uh, another type, under the low, the rigid type of hive. It is still under what you call the log hive. But in this case, we are trying to have a look at the farmer who cannot afford to make a hive. But he can use the readily available materials at home to come up with a hive. So it is kind of a basket hive, whereby making is very simple. You take the sticks, then you intertwine them together to come up with what you call this particular hive here. Then from outside, they smear with cow dung for protection against one, sunshine, very from then also in terms of the pest attack. So that is our basket hive, using the locally available materials to make it. Then here we have what you call uh, the, the bee smoker. So when handling bees at any angle, we encourage people to have smoke because once you get closer to a hive, the bees normally release what you call the alarm pheromone, which is an attack pheromone for the bees. So once you come in with the smoker, when you smoke around the hives, the smoke normally breaks down the bee communication, thereby making the bees to be a bit inactive so that you can handle them easier. They also become a bit docile for you to be able to uh, maybe work or harvest or inspect comfortably without uh, much so that is our bee smoker that we have here. So we encourage using smoke but not fire. 
Then now in the smoker, we normally have what you call the wood fuel that we use to give us the smoke. In this case, we prefer having what you call the wood shavings from our workshop there. So we just take the shavings, we put them in the fume chamber here. We put them inside here, and then either we can light it directly using a matchstick or we can use charcoal, the burning charcoal, to do the same until you have the smoke coming out from there. It's good. So here we have what we call the honey settling tank. So once we've done with the processing our honey, whereby we normally warm the honey at specific temperatures, we normally put in what you call the honey settling tank. So it is a settling tank plus a packaging tank. So we pour the honey here, we give it 72 hours for it to settle before we remove the scum, and then we package from that particular end here. So it is a settling tank, stock, a honey packaging tank, stainless steel. Good, so here with us we have what you call the, the honeycomb. So once we get our honey, after harvesting the honey from the honeycombs, we normally have the honeycombs remaining. So the combs, we don't throw them away, but to try to utilize them, whereby we normally boil them, then we sieve to get what you call the honey bees wax. Here is the wax that we get from our combs. Now from the wax, you can do what you call value addition to have many other products that are of value added, e.g. making of candles from the same, making of the body jelly, making of the shoe polish, and then also making of the shoe polish from the same for value addition purposes. So when, when, uh, when somebody wants to set up an app, we have got some factors they normally consider, as we just asked. One of them is the availability of water within a range of less than one kilometer for the bees. And then two, availability of forage. Forage is now the, are now the plants that give us flowers. And then three, the land should be easily accessible. That is one, when going to install the hives, when going to harvest the honey and doing the other hive uh, apiary activities. And then three, the soil drainage should be, it will be in a well-drained soil. Where we're not supposed to put your hive in a swampy area, that particular swampy nature normally affects the timber, making it humid, then making the timber to start rotting. Then lastly, you're supposed to consider the factor in terms of uh, the, uh, the around uh, spraying fields. You should be away from the spraying fields to avoid having contaminated honey as you go to harvest. Those are in terms of measuring in the lab, you have contaminated honey. So you consider from the spraying field to where you set up your apiary. Mostly above three kilometers and above this room then where you're setting up your apiary. Once you, you do the installation, first of all, you identify the area where you want to set up the apiary. And then two, you clear that particular area. And then three, you install your hives. Then now four, you wait for the colonization. Now in the hive colonization, where the bees occupy the hive, where you do the baiting, either using the wax or using the lemongrass oil to attack in the bees, or even propolis to attack in the bees. Then now once you have the bees, we do have what you call the colony inspection or hive inspection, whereby you can be opening your hives on a monthly basis to check on the progress. That is one, whether we have pests, whether we have the honey is ready, whether the bees are lacking something, you can easily tell from the hive inspection part of it. Then after doing the inspection, you, you must maintain your apiary to be clean. That is clearing. If you're having any of our bushes, you clear it. In case there is a drought, your bees are suffering from maybe, maybe lack of forage, you do what you call supplementary feeding. You give them sugar, syrup. Then also if you're having some, maybe you have a hive that is broken, you replace the same. Then now you go, till you go to harvesting. When harvesting, you harvest, you harvest in a professional manner. You don't harvest everything. You leave something for the bees, for them to avoid absconding immediately after doing the harvesting. So that is basically how we handle that, that in terms of management part of it. But you must be keen with the inspection at least once in a month. It can inform you of what is happening inside the hive. Yeah. Good, so now when you're setting, when you, are, when, you're setting, when you want to select your app where you're going to put your hives, first of all, you have at the environment at large, how it is. The another factor, you also have a look at the distance from where you want to put your hive to a homestead or a school or a busy road. So in terms of temperature, once the, once the environment is a, is a bit conducive, even for the other animal survival, the bees can do the same. But you, ha you have a look at the distance to where we have homesteads, where we have schools, where we have busy roads. And then also in terms of the soil drainage, you avoid in the water logged area, then now you can be good to go with the, with the beekeeping practice. Good, so here in Baraka we get, uh, we get propolis. Propolis is like the bee gum that they use in maybe in case of sealing any opening in the hive. We get the propolis, where we used to make what you call the propolis tincture. Then we sell to people who are, who are having uh, asthma or uh, any form of uh, allergies that they use at their respective homes. Then too we have the bee pollen. We collect the pollen, then we can do some form of validation to come with what we call the bee bread. Then also the pollen is high in protein. 
you can you can mix with honey, then you consume. We have what you call the bee venom. Now the bee venom is the venom that normally the bee when the bee stings you, then maybe your body swells or your body reacts. We harvest that here. Then now we then now we can even sell it to the international market. But as per now, we have what you call the unstratified market for the other bee products. So as Baraka, we can do it. But now any other farmer at the local level, he cannot do it because of the skill that are needed in maybe harvesting the same thing. But here we're trying to do it, but we're also trying to negotiate with APK to look for us even in terms of getting a market for the venom and the other bee products. Then also we have the what you call the royal jelly that normally harvest here, then we can sell, but as for now we don't have the market for the royal jelly, which is high in protein. Yeah. In terms of harvesting the uh, harvesting activity, it is normally it follows uh, uh, maybe certain steps whereby one we have a, we have a look at the number of hives that we have, which will tell us the number of people we need to may, maybe taking us through the process. So if you're having like 50 hives, you prefer having like five people. That is the labor, the first thing. And then two, after having the labor available, we have a look at the equipment to be used for doing the same. That is one having a, a look at the bee suit, the smoker, the bee brush, the hive tool than maybe any other necessary equipment. Then we have a look at the bee suits if they're in the good working conditions. Then we have a look at our smoker. Then thereafter we light our smoker, we put on our bee suits in a nice way, then we enter the apiary. And then now from there we distribute the duties effectively. One is holding the smoker, another one is holding the, then another one is there, standby to leave the supers, take them to the refinery room. So we go there, one with the smoker, then the other two like maybe in terms of opening the hive, the frames taking the honey out and then we go in the processing area so it is very simple then after harvesting we close the hive comfortably because the duties have been distributed effectively everybody knows what is supposed to do when it's in the in the hive so most in terms of time i normally say that it depends with where your apiary is for example if you're having an apiary that is closer to a homestead you are going to do it in the evening from around seven but now if the apiary is far away from activities either from a homestead either from a busy road, you can even do it from around three or four, as long as it is far from homestead, schools or busy roads.